Good morning. Uh, my name is Olivia Kirtley. I am the president of the International Federation of Accountants, and it's my pleasure to be here in Madrid to moderate this very distinguished panel. Um, I very much look forward to this discussion today, not only because I happen to be president of IFAC, but uh, particularly because I've spent so much of my career on many sides of the profession and because of my professional involvement in and reliance upon the profession. I started out uh, in public accounting, but then I moved to being a preparer, so I have been very much involved with the Accounting Standards Board and, and the Auditing Standards and the Ethical Standards, of course. Um, and I've also been a user <clears throat> and I'm very much a client of the profession uh, as an audit committee chair of several publicly listed companies, so therefore I rely upon the profession. So all of these topics today that we'll be, be discussing are uh, of very much importance uh, to me personally and to, to me in my role uh, at IFAC. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for taking the time out of their very, very busy schedules to be with us today, and to the PIOB for hosting this event. Given the deep knowledge that's present in this audience um, with regard to standard setting, I'm not going to review the need for international standard setting or that standard setting uh, must be in the public interest. Uh, the standard setting boards that are represented on the panel, of course, are the IAASB with Arnold Shoulder as the uh, chair, uh, the, uh, the International Accounting Standards Board with Hans Hugerforst as the uh, chair, and uh, the Ethics Board with uh, Stavros. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that this is my second time to hear the interaction uh, of not only of these three uh, standard setting board chairs, but we had the, the, um, also the chairs of the Education Standards Board and the Public Sector Accounting Standards Board, who all five came and um, were very gracious to come to an IFAC board meeting uh, this past summer. And it's the first time I think that all five of the standard setting board chairs have been in one place, and I will tell you that the interaction and the liveliness of the discussion and the interchange of ideas among the chairs was just terrific. And so I know you're in for a treat today hearing them um, here together. I'd first like to talk a little bit about the standard setting boards that are uh, where uh, IFAC provides the support. And that is the IAASB, uh, the Education and the Ethics uh, Standard Board, as well as the IPSASB, which is, as you know, is under a different oversight uh, regime. Uh, they each develop standards that are strong, relevant, and high quality because they have been produced by a model that is robust, rigorous, and firmly focused on the public interest. This model has produced standards that have now been adopted in more than 100 jurisdictions, which I think that that is a statement in and of itself as to the credibility and the reliance and the trust in the model. But like all standards, um, the high quality standards must keep pace with changing circumstances. The standard setting process must be independent it must produce standards that can be implemented globally, and it must operate in the public interest. So the opportunity for all of us uh, here is how to constructively enhance the standard setting process wherever we can, and to address any questions or perceptions of the independence of the standard setting process while doing as as I often say, like they say in medicine, my husband happens to be a doctor, while doing no harm uh, to the strong, robust, well-functioning model uh, so wisely put in place and, and described by, by the chairman earlier uh, as being put in place by our predecessors over 10 years ago. Looking forward, I believe there are several key principles that should guide our thinking into the future regarding the standard setting process. One, to be 
that it should be supported by a broad multi-stakeholder framework. Uh, we should maintain a transparent and accountable series of checks and balances to ensure the independence and objectivity with no stakeholder having undue influence. Uh, we must assure that the model involves extensive consultation and that the technical and other judgments of the standard setting boards are based solely on the board's deliberations, which are subject to extensive due process and oversight. Uh, there should be a periodic review of the standard setting process to ensure its excellence and independence and to confirm that the public's interest is truly being served. And finally, we need to support the model that we all agree upon uh, after those changes are made, any changes desired are made. Before turning it over to the panelists, I want to assure you the steadfast support of the entire executive team at the International Federation of Accountants for the st standard setting process. Uh, there are many of us here today that, um, that have been involved throughout this entire time. I can see many of you in the audience that were there at the beginning and helped establish and nurture uh, this strong model over the last uh, 10 years. It has served the public interest with distinction for the last decade and has held up well during the global financial crisis. Its strength has been acknowledged by two reviews of the monitoring group and it has grown in stature and acceptance as a consequence, as Eddie has said earlier. That means that we must continue to be open uh, to a dialogue though on advances um, that advances our shared commitment to the highest quality standards possible in the public interest. With that in mind, it's my pleasure to chair this session that will cover a wide range of topics, including um, how the standards are set in the public interest, suggestions for enhancing the public interest responsiveness, any lessons that have been learned in any early warning systems or any changes to the standards that would enhance that. And the whole subject of remaining relevant and keeping pace with change, um, including areas such as the data analytics and all the other changes that are going on around us very rapidly. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. Um, rather than to give you their bios, because I know that you all know them well and read about them often and know uh, much of their background, so I thought I would reflect on some of the, uh, their dedication by, uh, to this standard setting process by providing a quote from each of them that they might have made over the years. So gentlemen, you can, you can hear what it is that uh, I chose to to draw out of your prior um, years of experience, which have been many. Uh, Professor Arnold Shelder, who is chair of the IAASB since January of 2009. Uh, prior to his appointment, Arnold was a member of the managing board of the Dutch Central Bank, and among his many years of service to standard setting in the public interest, he has served as chair of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision's Accounting Task Force from 1999 to 2006, and was in fact a PIOB member at one time for two, from 2005 to 2008. In a speech to the eighth annual auditing conference in New York in 2013, Arnold said, and I quote, throughout history it is clear that there has been a strong call for our professional accountants to act in the public interest and to take into account the expectations society places on them and to understand these expectations and to respond to them through meaningful interactions. Interactions, therefore, in my view, are more than a concept. Rather, they are an essential and fundamental principle underpinning what we do. Um, Hans Hugerforst is uh, the chairman of the IASB, of course, since uh, 2011, and he is a former chairman of the executive board of the Netherlands Financial Markets Authority. Between 1998 and 2007, he held various posts in uh, the Dutch government, including uh, a very um, high position, which was that of 
finance minister. To an audience in Jakarta in 2013, Han said, for many emerging economies, adoption of IFRS has become an important statement of ambition, an international commitment to adhere to the highest possible standards of financial reporting. Dr. Stavros Tomadakis, I always stumble over that a little bit, Stavros, uh, prior to his appointment as chairman of the Ethics Standards Board in January of this year, uh, Stavros notably served as the first chair of the PIOB from 2005 to 2011. He also chaired the Hellenic Capital Markets Commission from 1998 to two, uh, 1996 to 2004. As Emeritus Professor of Financial Economics at the University of Athens, his research interests have extended to standard setting and infrastructures for the governance of global markets. In 2009, as PIOB Chairman, he gave a speech in Tallinn, Estonia, in which he said, to do the accounts of one entity well is indeed a matter of private interest. To do all accounts well, so that entities can compete with one another and so that outsiders can compare the outcomes of competition with a common yardstick is a matter of public interest. In other words, the ability to ensure that all accountants maintain high quality standards produces social value added. Gentlemen, you've all dedicated years of your life to professional standards and to the public interest. In your careers, you've traveled the world and talked to a wide range of audiences about the importance of both. And so it is indeed an honor to have you with us here in Madrid and to continue that conversation. And with that, I will, um, I will turn it over to Arnold for his remarks. Yeah, we're on a tough time management here, so let me make sure that I know where I'm starting. Um, good morning, and first of all, dear PIB members and staff, my warm congratulations on your birthday. Um, you're looking pretty young with 10 years, but on the other hand, I think it's obvious from everything you said, uh, Eddie, and what Olivia said, but also from this magnificent booklet about 10 years, that you already have achieved adultship, and that's pretty fast in 10 years. Um, so congratulations. On the other hand, thinking back of history, um, I thought we should be a bit modest, at least about the past, um, because in the end, uh, the PIB was almost founded on an illegal act. I remember very well when Donna Bovelaneas, the first Secretary General, came to Madrid from Basel, that she didn't have a work permit or whatsoever, and she was very concerned every day that the police would come around and pick her up. Uh, so that's how it all started. Um, I've chosen for today um, yeah, to start in the past and end up in the future with a brief overview of what I could well call four key projects of the IAASB. And the first, of course, is the clarified ISAs that have been finalized early 2009. And I just came on board, so it's clearly the merit of my predecessor, John Callas, and his team. And if you go through this book about 10 years, you will immediately see that this was a clear public interest response to audit failures. And just think of names like Enron and WorldCom, and they're all there. Um, that was part of the background. It was, as is written here, a holistic response to the heightening regulatory attention, and that's why all these founding fathers came together, IOSCO, Basel, etc., uh, attention to audit quality, and therefore challenges in the implementation of the global standards. Um, and the Clarity Project was a key backdrop to these robust 20 or 3 reforms that the monitoring group in close cooperation with, with IFAC established. And in light of that, the objectives were clear. Um, first of all, to improve the understandability of the ISA so that auditors could do a better job, uh, eliminating ambiguity, being more clear, making a clear distinction between requirements and application material, 
Um, so enhancing the quality of auditor performance, but also improve the relevance and the applicability to SMEs, so many special SME considerations, and also facilitate the global adoption. And that resulted in a really comprehensive uh, revision and redrafting of the ISAs. And a couple of years later, we carried out a so-called implementation monitoring review, and that confirmed that, in essence, uh, that project had achieved its objectives. Of course, more is to be done, but nevertheless. So I have a bit of a birthday present here, because um, you talked, Eddie, about the, the, the numbers, but I'm not quite sure whether you had this number already, because this is an update from last week. Until then, we had, uh, as jurisdictions that are using the clarified ISAs or committed to using them in the very near future, 106. And um, in uh, collaboration with IFEX compliance staff, you mentioned the importance of compliance work, uh, we could extend it to 110. And it's basically in various parts of the world. We added Bahrain, we added Nicaragua, Guatemala, but also Papua and New Guinea. So this is a very good overview of where we are now. Hans, I think I read in your last speech a couple of days ago that you have 116 countries where the IFRS are. And so we are closely following you. And, um, very pleased with this progress. There's more to come, certainly in Spanish-speaking countries or the Francophone African countries, but it's good progress. So as kind of a mini, mini birthday present, uh, I could now say we have these 110. And I have a very symbolic thing later on to, to illustrate that. But that's where we are currently with the global adoption of the clarified ISA. So that was the first uh, major project to respond to public interest concerns about audit quality. The second almost flagship project was, of course, our auditor reporting project. And I very deliberately call this a response to user needs. And um, Olivia, you have chosen very well, I would say, that quote that you gave from the 2013 speech, because indeed um, it is this response to users, the, the, the interactions with society. Some think that, that we did this because of the crisis. That's not true. We started um, in 2006 by commissioning research, independent research, asking users what is it that you expect that you need from the auditor's report. And in 2014, we finalized the standards and you have approved it thereafter. Um, that will and is determining the future of global auditor reporting and improved auditor communications. As some say already, I see it more and more, the auditor is coming out of the black box. Um, there's an EFR quote saying that uh, it becomes more observable, both because of audit reporting and audit quality indicators. And that is certainly essential to the continued relevance of the audit profession, not in the interest of the profession itself, but in the interest of all its various users. And we learned from that research that the audit opinion is certainly valued, but it's very short. It's basically a traffic light, green, sometimes orange or red. And users therefore had a very clear message to us. We want more relevant and decision useful information about the entity and the audit of the financial statements. And of course, the UK was a pioneering country here. And we now see investor awards uh, about the most insightful and the most innovative audit reports. I think three years back we couldn't even have dreamed of that. So it's a great development that we see. And of course central in that new audit reporting are the key audit matters, more about going concern, etc. And we see the adoption now progressing, certainly in Europe, where it's all mandated and coming into place, uh, but also in other parts of the world. We have just recently seen some early birds in South Africa, in Australia, where just a few years ago there was still a lot of reluctance to engage in this, but it's changing. People see why this makes sense. Singapore as well, etc. So I'm very pleased with that progress as well. And it is a clear illustration, and that's why it was so good that you mentioned, Olivia, the importance of interactions. We also published in 2014 the framework for audit quality, describing the many factors that play a role in achieving audit quality. And the key message there indeed is um, the importance of the interactions between auditors and management and users and regulators and those charged with governance. Of course, audit quality is primarily the responsibility of uh, the auditors themselves, but each stakeholder 
can play and should play, and that's also our call, an important role in supporting that high-quality financial reporting and auditing. So audit quality is best achieved in an environment where there is support from our participants. And I remember very well in my auditing time before Central Bank how a challenging audit committee really could stimulate you, really give the best that you could with all your colleagues around the world to make an audit of audit of high quality. And I'm very pleased to see that this framework and the thoughts there are taken up more and more because I think it's central in the way forward and continuing outreach with, with everybody. But then the future. Um, because we have now embarked on a number of new projects. And last week, all week, we had a very interesting debate in the IWSB in the week before in our consultative advisory group, well chaired by the new chair, Matt Wolderen, well observed by Chuck Horstman de Kerk and Karel van Hullen in the board meeting, where we are discussing key topics that we now have on our agenda, quality control, group audits, financial institutions and professional skepticism. And if you would ask why are they on your agenda, well, it's because on one hand we need to be responsive to external developments in businesses and how they develop structures and organizing themselves, the challenges to businesses themselves, the nature of their activities, uh, the high technology developments, etc. But also developments in audit firms and how they want to be responsive to that. But then I also mentioned the implementation monitoring review, and of course we learned about a number of issues where the ISAs could be enhanced. And um, the audit inspection findings by IFR and other regulators kind of new compared to five years ago and we certainly take that to heart as well. So all of that informed the start of these projects. Um, but we also have to take into account its wider context. Of the, the world is changing for auditors with this audit reporting, with audit quality and indicators. So as said, out of the black box becoming more observable to all stakeholders. And that's why we brought together these topics. First of all, we said, well, these are four independent topics, but as soon as we started discussing them in March, we said, well, there are so many overlapping areas. Just think of professional skepticism, um, which, by the way, is a project that we do together with the Ethics Board and the Education Board. Um, but professional skepticism, of course, equally applies in the area of quality control, challenging your colleagues, uh, challenging yourself. Um, it applies to group audits, how you run a group audit, how you deal with your component auditors and other auditors. <coughs> Financial institutions, the fair values, the new IFRS 9 that we are considering very intensely. So there's a lot in common between these four topics and I could of course give more examples. So what we have decided to do is to publish at the end of this year, after our December board meeting, a so-called invitation to comment on ITC which is a similar construct as we did with audit reporting. And that um, is really a very strong invitation to comment to all stakeholders. And already now we are reaching out to many to say, well, be with us. It's comprehensive. It will not be a simple document. We will try to make it simple for, let's say, the, the not informed, not technical people. That will be a four part, but then there will be a lot of more technical stuff as well for the regulators, the auditors, etc. And then, after we have received feedback mid-2016, we will allow for an ample comment period. Um, we will uh, start standard-setting projects for each of these topics more specifically. However, as a result of uh, last week's and week before meeting with the CAC and, and the, the board, we already have decided to even advance the financial institutions standard-setting project. Um, Originally, the thought of two phases, but we will bring it all together. So we have requested this group to bring forward to the board meeting in December a project proposal where we need to enhance standards like 540 and others. And all of that, in the end, with the clear perspective of enhancing audit quality in today's and tomorrow's environment with a very clear public interest perspective. Now, amidst of the many, <coughs> the many documents that we had, we also tried to summarize a bit what is it in the end that we want to achieve, what is this all about. Um, and maybe this is kind of a summary for the moment, may change. And that we said the ISAs need to better address the increasing complexity and the new technologies, you mentioned the data analytics, in the business and audit environment. 
and we need to deliver against the public's heightening expectations of quality. It's very encouraging that the expectations gap will never disappear because it's going up all the time and we have to deliver, continues to deliver against that. And the profile of tomorrow's auditor has to be a critical challenger, independent, robust, challenging rather than corroborating and supported by a regime that is well focused on public interest and quality management of a modern nature linked to the COSO framework and well observable for stakeholders. And therefore, this ITC will be a very strong call for an ongoing and increasing active dialogue with all kinds of stakeholders. And again, it's so much to that quote, Olivia. That's the way forward. In the interest of time, I have not mentioned some other projects that we are busy with as well. We discussed last week data analytics. We discussed cyber security and corporate governance. We discussed integrated reporting. Um, but we are in a bit earlier phase there because we first want to educate ourselves with the help of experts. Um, what is it all about and what is it that we need to address? So plenty of uh, work ahead. And now I come to my small symbolic present, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have drafted myself this one which is 110, as you see, and on one hand it has the 10, which of course is the PIVs, 10 years. On the other hand, it has the 110, which are the ISA jurisdictions that I just mentioned. And if you wouldn't mind, I would like to offer it. I've drawn it myself. It has not been part of due process, but it has been done very independently. Thank you, Arnold. Oh, there you go. That was excellent. Thank you. And a little surprise at the end. We like that, too. Um, and so um, next we will hear from Hans uh, with regard to the International Accounting Standards Board. Thank you, Olivia. <clears throat> I'm a bit lazy, so I'm going to remain seated for my uh, introductory comments. First of all, uh, congratulations, Eddie. Uh, congratulations, PIOB. Uh, as some of you uh, may know, I used to be chair of the monitoring group, and it was my privilege to monitor Stavros. <laughs> and, and we are both very stubborn people, so it was not always easy, uh, but always constructive and always with a good solution. Uh, and uh, I am glad to see that uh, the monitoring, or that the uh, PIOB has strengthened its, its role in the, in the last uh, couple of uh, years. So I'm going to talk about the uh, public interest of IFRS. And I've spent uh, part of the summer trying to write it down what it exactly is. And it's about 10 pages, not just the public interest, what it is, but also how we try to achieve it. Um, mainly written in a uh, uh, flare of irritation uh, caused by uh, a completely uh, warped re uh, 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 reports written for uh, the European Parliament. I'll get back to that later. So what is the public interest of, uh, of uh, IFRS? Well, we have summed it up in our mission statement in a, one sentence, and it says, our work serves the public interest by fostering trust, growth, and long-term financial stability in the economy. How do we get there? Well, we get there by bringing transparency, accountability, and efficiency to financial markets uh, around the world. Um, and let me say, uh, that's our holy trinity, transparency, accountability, efficiency. And let me say a little bit more about each of those. First of all, transparency. Obviously, accounting standards try to bring uh, transparency, and we do that on an international scale. So we both want to raise the level of the quality of financial reporting uh, with our standards, uh, and also we want to increase international uh, comparability. Uh, and in that respect, we have achieved a lot by bringing all these countries uh, uh, to one standard. And 
uh, those, uh, uh, that increased uh, transparency uh, enables investors, but also creditors and other market participants to make informed economic decisions around the world. So that's transparency. Then accountability, well, that is, of course, where the word accounting comes from. Uh, and uh, we try, with our standards, to reduce the information gap between those who entrust their money to uh, the entities, to the companies, either by uh, giving credits, by giving loans, or by investing uh, their money, to reduce the information gap between the providers of capital and the people to whom they have entrusted that money. And, uh, well, as we uh, all know, that is a, it's fantastic in our capital markets that that is done on a big scale. A lot of people are working with other people's money, but the moral hazard problems are also huge. And we try to contribute by reducing that moral hazard problem by increasing the accountability of uh, those who use that capital. So uh, we pr try to provide uh, the information that is needed to hold management to account, uh, and that is not just uh, important for investors, it's also very important to regulators around the world. Our current uh, uh, conceptual framework has a very funny sentence that uh, regulators do not belong to the primary audience of IFRS. I, I know why you got there, but I think it's nonsense. Okay. Um, the efficiency, uh, efficiency that we uh, try to receive comes from uh, several uh, sources. First of all, improved capital allocation. Investors know more about uh, opportunities and risks around the world, and it helps them to identify those opportunities and risks and put their money in the, uh, uh, there where it will most likely bring the highest results. And for businesses, uh, we always say we work primarily for investors, and, uh, but, but obviously for businesses it's also a huge efficiency that they can use a single trusted accounting uh, language. It, it, it has several effects. It uh, lowers the, uh, the cost of capital. We've seen that in lots of emerging uh, countries, but also in Europe, for example, when IFRS was, uh, uh, was introduced, several academic studies have pointed out that there was a lowering of capital uh, costs. So that's very beneficial to the preparers as well. And it also reduces international uh, reporting costs if you can work with one language. Uh, and that is, for example, one of the reasons why in Japan, uh, Japan has not obligated all companies to use IFRS as a voluntary choice, and it's one after the other that adopts IFRS. When I started, there were only four uh, Japanese companies. It's now almost 100, and we're going rapidly towards 40% of the market cap in uh, Japan that chooses for IFRS. <clears throat> and they, they do that because it's simply good business. Uh, it is easy, it uh, saves costs, and it improves their relations with international uh, investors. And of course, for uh, the international audit firms uh, to work with one global uh, language apart from uh, US GAAP is also a huge cost saver and it uh, allows them to, 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 uh, to build up their technical knowledge uh, in a very efficient, uh, in a very efficient uh, way. So I think the total economic gains from IFRS, it's very hard to estimate, but I think it's many billions, many billions of dollars or euros or, or pounds. Uh, and uh, so the fact that we do that for 25 million uh, pounds a year is really the best buy uh, that the international community ever made. Uh, I said something in, 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 in my opening sense about financial stability, that that is also what we try to achieve, long-term financial stability. That has always, been, has always been a bit contentious because often people and, and that's also from the regulatory community. They like us to make standards that do not show too much instability because their life is already big, difficult enough as it is. Uh, so it's not as if we should, that, and that's why uh, the ISB has always been very reticent to see itself having a role in promoting financial stability. Well, I think that's also not so smart. I, th I think we do have a role in promoting financial stability because you cannot have fi durable financial stability without proper information. So, uh, and, but that's why we say long-term financial stability because proper accounting can, in the short run, increase stability or instability because it can show problems. But you can only solve problems if you see them, and that's why 
uh, why, why uh, sometimes instability is a little bit necessary. But long term, we contribute to stability. Then explaining how we achieve working for the public, in, public interest, that is more of a challenge for us because we are privately organized. And there are a lot of people who do not understand that. And I just uh, told you about that report that was written for the European Parliament. Uh, and it contained all the usual uh, uh, prejudices, uh, 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 misconceptions about uh, about us, we are Anglo-American self-regulatory culture in accounting, and we privilege commercial interests. Well, uh, first of all, we are certainly, uh, when you look at our uh, governance, you can find that also in Korea, in Japan, and Germany, and the Netherlands, so there's not much Anglo-American about that. Um, and certainly, <coughs> we do not uh, uh, privilege commercial interests. Uh, key is that the board is completely independent. None of the board members have any functions in for-profit organizations. None of us are, have directorships in companies, nothing, nothing of the sort. So there are absolutely no conflicts of interest. Uh, and that is extremely important because there is a lot of pressure on our work, as you all know, especially from the preparer community, from companies. They have huge vital interests in being able to smooth earnings over time. Uh, their pay is often uh, uh, related to uh, the share price and also to uh, the P&L. Uh, so there are lots of, um, uh, the, the pressure is always the same, take away all volatility uh, and um, uh, give us as much room as possible to, uh, to uh, smooth, smoothen is here a nice word, smooth our earnings over time. And, and, and we don't want too many liabilities on the balance sheet. It used to, uh, uh, and, and we had tremendous uh, uphill battles, uh, the uh, share-based payments, as you all know, to get the pension liability uh, on the balance sheet still needs to be done for the public sector. And uh, the lease, to get leases on the balance sheet, well, we, it's, the standard will come out in uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm optimistic that it will get done, but it's not easy. Uh, and then finally, we are certainly, oh yes, one, one word about our financing. Most of our financing comes from, uh, through publicly sponsored uh, uh, arrangements, but we still receive about 25% uh, from the audit firms. Um, and, and a lot of people uh, think that that is wrong, and that we are under the thumbs of the whole audit firms. Uh, again, the same old conspiracy of Anglo-American self-regulation. Um, I've written uh, about that in this paper as well. What I've basically said was, first of all, it's very reasonable that the audit firms pay us because, as I said, it is, represents a huge cost saving for, for the audit community. Uh, <clears throat> okay, then the problem may be that the contribution is voluntary, uh, so they might want something back uh, for their uh, contribution. Well, what I've said, well, in practice, we, don't, we never sense pressure from uh, the audit uh, firms. And it is, I think, because here the public interest and the private interest are parallel. We are both interested in auditable standards. And there is, uh, unless you think, well, you know, the audit firms have a, and, and some think that, have a big interest in making the standards as complicated as possible so that the, uh, the, the smaller firms don't have a chance. Uh, well, we, 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 um, well, first of all, we don't need them to make our standards complicated. We are very good at, we are very good at that ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> Finally, we are not self-regulatory. Uh, we do not impose our standards. Uh, our standards are all um, adopted by uh, public authorities around the world. Nothing self-regulatory about uh, that. And we are also supervised by uh, a monitoring board of uh, securities regulators, which is a relationship that, that we are completely happy with. So there is a public overlay in our, uh, in our uh, uh, governance. And finally, we really have a state-of-the-art due process. Everything is, uh, that we do is transparent. And sometimes it's very difficult. Only last week we had a board meeting about a deferral of uh, 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 IFRS 9 for the insurance industry. And I have not pre-cooked the decision. Uh, it's very hard because 
our, we, we cannot meet with more than six board members at a time to, uh, to prevent uh, pre-cooking of uh, decision uh, making. And um, uh, it was a 7-7 seven, seven vote, uh, and I had to cast my, um, uh, my casting vote uh, to get the deferral through. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of board members uh, are a bit, uh, are getting a little bit uh, sick of being bullied by both insurance and uh, and, and Europe, uh, and so it was a very close call. But it was all visible to the outside world, and I think that's a really great good. Uh, it doesn't make life easy for us, uh, but there are a lot of public institutions that, that do not come close in terms of transparency. Okay, these are. Thank you very much, Hans. That was excellent. Very interesting, all of those perspectives. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll now move to Stavros uh, with regard to the Ethics Standards Board. Stavros. Thank you very much, Olivia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Let me start off, start off by saying that, uh, of course, I'm the one who's very happy to be here today because I want to congratulate the chairman, all the PIOB members and the staff who have, I see, brought the PIOB to that stage and that point where it has become an institution of uh, uh, monitoring. And I uh, must say that this is important because it is something of course, to start up uh, a venture, but to stabilize it and institutionalize it is uh, a very important step. So my congratulations to all of you. Um, I'm very happy that you're doing your best to maintain and expand this. Uh, let me secondly say that uh, since I'm the newest of the standard setting chairs, uh, I'm only nine months in the job, I can, uh, I'm very happy to be the last to speak because I can echo uh, and share a lot of what uh, uh, my friends uh, who preceded me said. Uh, and of course, with Arnold, we share a lot of common uh, viewpoints and a common perspective on how uh, standard setting in the context of our uh, two boards uh, is to be pursued. Uh, since I'm, as I said, relatively young in this job, uh, uh, some of the things I will say are tentative and may be revised uh, in a future meeting that we will have. But let me start off by saying that um, although we're not at 110 um, in terms of uh, adoption of the standards, the ESBA code is quite widely accepted around the world. We uh, think we are at about 100 jurisdictions. Uh, and of course, I should say that the 27 large transnational firms are also applying the code. And that means that the code is quite powerful. It's uh, quite influential. And of course, we're looking up to the IASB and the IAASB to reach, catch up with them in terms of uh, adoption and implementation. But we're not there yet. We still have to work. Let me also point out uh, that uh, the code is a principles-based code for global use, and it applies not only to accountants in public practice, but also to accountants practicing in business. And this is an important component, which sometimes is um, uh, neglected to be mentioned, but I think that it is very important in terms of what is happening even today in the corporate world and the ethical responsibilities of accountants that operate in business environments and in corporations. Uh, let me finally point out that um, the ultimate objective of an ethics code is, of course, to shape mentalities and shape behaviors, raising the bar uh, in terms of uh, ethical attitudes. Uh, so it seems to me that ethical norms are long-term constructs and 
in designing or redesigning the code, we should think of it in, uh, a long, on a long-term basis. They should be stable and durable uh, uh, constructs. And I share and echo what Eddie said in his uh, introduction that um, these standards are public goods. Indeed, they are public goods, and the ethics code par excellence uh, is a public good, not only in the sense of being implemented by its end users, but also, I feel, in these times, in the sense of also being an example. I have a feeling, leaving in these times, as I said, that there is a need for ethics codes in many other places besides uh, the accounting profession and the auditing practice. Uh, there is a need for corporate ethics codes. There is a need for ethics codes in financial institutions. Coming from Greece, I would say there is a need for ethics codes in politics. So it seems to me that uh, the ethics code can radiate uh, the example to other areas that can use it as a basis for providing norms and standards in that area. Uh, let me say that the major response to the public interest that is very recent and that is going on right now is a project that the Ethics Board is uh, working on right now. That's called the Structure Project. And that is a project that involves a large renovation of the code in response to uh, a widely acknowledged need for clarity, for usability, and for enforceability of the code. In a sense, the Ethics Board is going through something like the clarity project that the IAASB undertook a few years back. And we think that the completion and the adoption of the new clarified restructured code is going to make a major public interest uh, contribution, uh, not only in terms of uh, more effective uh, implementation, uh, but also, as I said, in terms of um, wider adoption. The restructuring does not mean that the code is changing in substance. It means, however, that the structure is changing and we're clarifying what is the objective, what is the requirement, what is the guidance, uh, following to a significant extent what happened with the ESAs, uh, but with considerable differences given that the subject matter is different. So we expect a lot of public interest benefits from this project, and we're putting a lot of energy, a lot of attention, and a lot of resources in this. Uh, let me uh, point out that um, the, uh, um, rest this restructuring of the code uh, creates, of course, quite an interesting and difficult management problem for us, because we have other projects that are going on at the same time. And I'm sure that some of you are aware of them, but let me enumerate. Uh, we have the famous NOCLAR project, uh, the non-compliance with law, law and regulations, and the reporting requirements uh, for auditors and for accountants in business, by the way. Uh, we have a project that looks at safeguards, this threats and safeguards framework, which is pervasive in the code, is uh, reviewed through the Safeguards Project. We have a project on long association, and this, I'm sure most of you are aware, relates to issues of fresh look and rotation of uh, auditors in practice. And uh, finally, we have uh, the project on what we call Part C, which is that part of the code that refers to uh, accountants in business, not the auditors, the other part, the other part of the accounting universe, which I repeat, I think is very important. Uh, so there is a review going on uh, in, in, in that part. So all these together 
are going to uh, be quite, to, to represent quite a radical refurbishing of the code along with the restructuring project. And the management problem that we currently have, and it's not a problem, it's a task, I should say, and a challenge, uh, is that we want all this to fit in a time framework so that instead of delivering piecemeal uh, improvements, we're going to deliver by the end of 2017 the restructured code and a significant portion, uh, the most significant portion of these projects uh, restructured into the restructured code. So it's um, a little big bang, if you will. Uh, and this responds to uh, public interest uh, issues also because a lot of stakeholders have been complaining about this uh, continuous uh, tweaking and changing and so forth. So we're making uh, a fixed uh, and significant contribution uh, to the new face of the code. And we have high hopes that this will uh, be our major public interest response at this time. Now, let me uh, talk a little bit and conclude about um, our relationships with stakeholders. Uh, consultation and due process are, of course, one of the very important safeguards in the public interest commitment and in what we do. Uh, and we do issue consultation papers, uh, but despite that, and we do have a CAG, of course, which is quite representative, but besides that, I think that we have to develop and grow our strategy uh, in uh, relations with uh, stakeholders. And there are categories of stakeholders who are very important in the hierarchy of consultation. And of course, the regulatory community is very uh, important in this and um, so on. But there are user groups who need to be upgraded, I feel, in our uh, consultation strategy. And of course, in this, I include investors. And it's something we're, we're certainly going to look at. And also to look at the examples of existing consultation models with investors on the part of other organizations, for example, the PCAOB. But not only investors, we have, um, we think that a good part of the code um, requires us to engage in much closer consultation with um, people who are in corporate governance, those in charge uh, of governance. This is, this is a very important group in which I think we need an upgrading um, of uh, relationships and consultation. And finally, the national standard setters. I find that the national standard setters, I've had one meeting with them, I find that the national standard setters are a very important group. And I would very much like to institutionalize our consultation with them uh, because they are both a source of input uh, to our work, but they are also the ones who can regulate issues of adoption and implementation once our work is completed and the code goes back into the adoption phase. So that is a group uh, which I think we should intensify our relations to. Finally, um, I really have a feeling, and maybe that's because uh, I have had a long time in academia, uh, but I think that complex reality on the ground is a very important stakeholder, if you want. We really have to know what is going there, on there. In the markets, uh, I mean in the audit markets, in the regulatory landscape, in the behavioral findings where we have by now very significant empirical evidence coming from the inspection findings uh, and the very important work that DFR is doing trying to collate and to um, uh, draw uh, conclusions from inspection findings. So it seems to me that uh, we, the Ethics Board, must uh, increase our investment in research and fact-finding 
because as I said, reality as it is involving is a very important stakeholder after all, for which we should all be, to which we should all uh, be drawn. So let me conclude, um, and I'll be happy to, of course, uh, uh, answer questions, m make additional remarks during the discussion uh, session. Uh, but let me conclude by saying that above all this, our relationship with the PIOB is, of course, very important. And it must be a relationship which we should try to continue and coordinate so that uh, not only do we interact on specific issues, but we can also interact on policies and directions. Uh, this, to my mind, having been, if you will, on both sides, uh, seems to be uh, a very, very important step forward uh, to share views on directions and um, strategy, if you will, uh, with the PIOB. And I know, of course, that there is a lot of uh, willingness and capacity for that on that side. So with that comment, I want to thank you all very much. And thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Stavros, very much. Uh, now we come to um, the, the interactive part of this uh, panel, which uh, uh, look very much forward to. I, I'd like to begin, Stavros, since, since you've already commented on uh, the greater interaction um, and, uh, with regard to the, the key stakeholders, and um, uh, Arnold has commented on uh, interaction and the importance of that, and I know that's important uh, in Hans' work also, but I'd like to maybe um, go back to, to both Arnold and Hans with regard to um, how, any thoughts they might have on either how they have been uh, enhancing uh, the public interest responsiveness in the standard setting process through increased uh, interaction with people like investors, those charged with gover governance, other stakeholders, and and maybe even add in there, you know, the SMEs um, with regard to the impact of the standards uh, on that group. Uh, Arnold, I know in particular when you were going through the new auditors uh, reporting project uh, that you reached out and engaged uh, with audit committee chairs and others charged with governance, which. Uh, uh, I participated in one of those, and I, I found uh, very, very, very helpful. But maybe we, you can talk just a minute about uh, those interactions and what the, sort of the progression of that has been over time as far as the, the uh, volume of the interactions and how you do that on a, on a global basis to make sure you get that global view. Okay, thanks, uh, Olivia. Um, in essence, it's all the time trying to meet with people that you not so easily encounter. It's not that difficult to meet with regulators, so we have an ongoing basis and rhythm in that. It's not so difficult to meet with audit firms, in the form of firms, etc. But investors is more difficult. I remember one time a quote from one of your staff, Hans Weynupten, who said, well, you need almost to grab investors, lock them in a room and say, now we want an answer. And that's not blaming on investors, but first of all, they're very busy people. Second, they really need to appreciate that you call upon their time to spend that with you in a dialogue. Um, so one way of doing that is, of course, through the consultative advisory group, where there are several investor representation groups. And of course, it's now chaired by Matt Waldron from the CFA Institute. But then also we really are looking for opportunities to meet. And uh, there are several examples, some very simple. We have now and then a conference call with the so-called Global Auditor Investor Dialogue, which is only a one hour call, but very much appreciated, I think, to updating them and hearing feedback from them. We meet with special groups like in the UK, the IMA, um, with the ICGN, the National Corporate Governance Network, and sort of more examples, um, and nevertheless, um, I think we have an outstanding record in all modesty of how many outreach we do, and it's not just the chairman, 
that many of my board members and staff and technical advisors. Nevertheless, this is a mission that's never been completed. So now we are up with this uh, new ITC that uh, on the, the four major projects. We again will look for many opportunities to meet with people that, as I said, are not so easy to meet with. And we have got very strong calls and we fully agree uh, to have certainly the first part of this overarching document in December very readable, very much focused on essence to indeed invite that dialogue. Let me stop there because, of course, I can continue. But does it provide an answer, <coughs> Olivia? Certainly. Hans? Well, what I have experienced throughout my um, career in public office is that when you try to do something in the public interest, that the public is often not interested. <laughs> <laughs> because the only people who are the, the public interest is often very general and amorphous, uh, and it, it, it is probably it is. I spent a lot of time in governments who tried to reform the welfare state to make the economy stronger, which is in everybody's interest. But first, you have to explain. Yes, we have to take away your benefits or reduce them, and that is all very nasty. But if you wait five years, then uh, you know we'll see we can reduce taxes. First, we have to reduce the budget deficit, and then we can reduce taxes, and then everybody will be better off. And by that time, everybody has you know uh, stopped listening to your story. And it's no no different with with accounting. Um, uh, the uh, the investors who we do the work for are often not so interested. They see financial statements as a given. They don't have, um, uh, they follow a lot of companies uh, and they don't have time to acquire specialized knowledge about accounting, which is very difficult to acquire, I can say from now personal experience. Um, and uh, whereas preparers, they work with the standards professionally, they have unlimited resources almost to, to, to work with it, they have the knowledge and they're highly motivated because their pay is often uh, dependent on uh, and, and their, their reputation is dependent on the outcome of uh, financial uh, reporting. So they have huge incentives to be interested in our work. So what we need to do is to try to balance the influence of preparers with those of investors and uh, so uh, if they don't call us, we call them. Uh, and, and, and we, we uh, well, we have uh, advisory groups uh, just like uh, Arnold, uh, but we also cold call investors. Uh, this is what we are doing, what do you think? Uh, we uh, create special documents for them which are much easier to read, which are not so technical. What do you think? Uh, and we have brought in now a group of, uh, 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 a group of uh, institutional investors, buy-side investors, to get them more involved in, uh, in our work. These people have a lot of money and uh, they, they, they are well resourced. And it is coming up to steam. Um, now that uh, you know, there is so much uh, money under management in the capital markets, uh, there is more and more interest in, in, in working with us. So my long-term hope is that the investor will become a more powerful constituent uh, in, 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 in our work. Thank you. Uh, Stavros, did you have anything else um, on this particular topic? Uh, <clears throat> no, just um, I want to pick up on what Hans just said. Uh, there is, of course, the world of buy-side uh, investment managers and institutional investors. Uh, who is probably missing a little bit from our universe. And this is something that we could uh, direct some attention to, I, I specifically. I'd like to ask uh, just one more question of the group, and then uh, I'd like to open it up uh, uh, to the audience if there's anything you would like to, to ask of any of the chairs. Um, I guess, you know, we've seen that uh, and we heard uh, when you appeared together before the IFAC board that there is a lot of interrelationship about the, the subject matters that, that you work on. And I'd like to hear you comment on um, whether there were any lessons learned from uh, recent or current projects such as going concern, no clear uh, disclosures and assuring that the consistency of and, and the, the uh, support of the different standards between um, 
audit and ethics and, and accounting standards in particular, um, since the three of you are here. And so any lessons learned, any, any uh, takeaways from any of the, pro the recent projects or the current projects going on about how the boards uh, could uh, work better together? Arnold? Well, maybe not so much a lesson learned, but we just noted how hard you have to strive to have dialogues with investors, and you can equally call for audit committee members or preparers, etc. Um, I think the examples that you just alluded to illustrate the need for um, looking for an active dialogue with the fellow standard setters. Um, if I take the current example of financial institutions, um, we have a what I really would call a strong dialogue with uh, the Basel Committee uh, Accounting Expert Group. Nick van Ende is sitting there. We have visited them several times, the same for the insurance supervisors. Um, but then also with the uh, IASB and its staff. Um, one of them is a member of our CAC, but we have had specific dialogue about IFRS 9, understanding what the IASB already has done and is doing in providing guidance. We have met uh, ourselves, but also our staff and the working group to make sure that we have as much as input as we can from the IASB on the IFRS 9. When we are drafting, let's say, the, the equivalent in, in the auditing standards. And that's going very well, but it's very active and you have to look for it. Um, Disclosures is a similar example where we reached out intensely to the IASB as they have a major, major project on that and we wanted to address that, how the auditing standards have to apply. So it's basically the, the same mechanism of looking for interactions and not in an easy way but in an intense way and that I think results in a level of expectations um, on the other side that if we wouldn't do that then they would immediately come after us and say, well, hold on, that's not what we expected. Uh, Nick is already nodding to that. But the same, uh, Janine, my go for if you are next week in Tokyo, we have an intense discussion with the Standards Coordination Working Group on these future projects, etc. So we, we are looking for that and we are encouraging, in this case, the audit regulators to be even more with us, maybe observing board meetings or have special roundtables or whatsoever. The more we can do that, and certainly in earlier phases of the project, uh, that, that's very helpful. I think um, generally we, um, we work uh, very well uh, together. Um, around the issue of good, uh, going concern, uh, we, we went back and forth uh, uh, quite a bit because the, the IASB was, was disappointed uh, that we didn't, uh, yeah. that, we uh, that we decided not to change uh, the standard. And I've been thinking about that quite a bit and I, I still think that we made the right decision. Um, uh, first of all, um, because why, why is everybody talking, or why were people talking about that? Because no auditor warned for the financial crisis. Well, I think here I'm always willing to, uh, to, to blame auditors, but I really think that here there was a, uh, an issue of collective, uh, uh, collectively looking the other way. Uh, everybody could have seen from IFRS statements that uh, the banks had no capital prior to the, uh, prior to the, uh, the financial crisis, or almost no capital. RBS, before taking over ABN AMRO, had perhaps 2% capital, and most of that was a goodwill. And that was all out in the open, but we had a regulatory system that said, well, the 2% capital ends up being 12% uh, Basel capital, and every thought, everybody thought that it was hunky-dory. So if, if, you know, for auditors in this environment to stand up, yeah, but my bank is uh, about to go broke, I, I, I don't think they can be blamed for that. Secondly, we, 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 we uh, the staff in, 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 in looking at this issue looked at companies that went broke and found that in most cases, uh, prior to going broke, they had uh, uh, disclosed their difficulties. So there was something, there, there was already uh, information uh, being provided. And what we thought was that, well, if uh, we, uh, our standard says uh, you only have to, have to disclose 
the when uh, after all the, you have risks but uh, you have taken countermeasures against those risks and you only have to disclose what is left uh, if, if there are risks left that you are not able to properly uh, deal with we were afraid that if we would require a gross presentation of all the risks and the measures that you have taken, that there would be a, uh, the problem of disclosure overload would be, would would get uh, would get worse, and that's why we decided not to, not to do so. And as far as I'm, I understand, an auditor needs to be sure that a, or needs to be confident that a company is going conserve be, before he can sign off. Uh, so I'm not sure that an explicit statement would have added all that much, to tell you the truth. Um, just adding to that, first of all, I fully agree, if there is a so-called going concern issue, a material uncertainty that has to be disclosed, both actually by management and the auditor. But I think what we added to that, and that's still, I think, in light of the crisis, very important, a kind of reinforcing an early warning mechanism, um, requiring the auditor to review the adequacy of management's disclosures when discussing a so-called close call situation. So management and the board and the audit committee have been discussing, are we having a going concern issue? Are we up to a material uncertainty? Well, if so, then you have to disclose. But if you in the end conclude, if not, then it's not just hallelujah and say, well, there is no issue. No, no. That, and that's what your interpretations committee confirmed to us, and that was very helpful. That has to be disclosed by management as well. So we have a new requirement in this going concern standard. Auditors, you have to review the adequacy of those disclosures. And that hopefully will reinforce yes. that in an early phase you would see. But yeah, so if, is, if there is a lot of judgment required yeah. to come to the conclusion that uh, a company is still going concern, then there needs to be disclosure. And we have clarified that, and I think that's a help. What I also think is really a very good innovation is the key audit matters. Because it uh, has a lower threshold, it's not an atomic weapon. Uh, the, uh, the, the statement of not going concern, that's an atomic weapon. It's hard to use. But key audit matters is, uh, has a lower threshold and is therefore, I think, extremely useful. And yeah, I think it has already led to, so, so, to, to some good, good, good results. Uh, Stavros, I'll see if you have anything, but uh, I'd also like to see if there are any questions from the audience, which uh, I can't imagine that there would be, but uh, Stavros, do you want to say anything or we can go to... Well, I just want to say something very briefly because we do have uh, an example in the case of NOCLAR of interaction between ourselves and the IWSB. Uh, which uh, has, I think, is being concluded, but uh, we have decided that we should keep a permanent liaison together. So on any projects that we do or any project that the IWSB does, uh, we, are, we have an early warning system of items that the other board might want to take into account. And this is clearly uh, uh, an important procedural, but also substantial uh, step. So I wanted to point this out. And of course, Arnold did mention the uh, tripartite group on uh, skepticism that we have with the education board. Chris Austin of the education board is back there, by the way. Uh, the three of us working. So these are, I think, good practical examples. Uh, I know that the panelists know most of you in the room, but if you would just do them the courtesy of introducing yourself um, before you uh, ask your question. Carol. Thank you, Kyle von Hulle, Public Interest Oversight Board. Uh, I want to come back on the going concern issue because this is a clear public interest uh, area. My worry is in the debate, listening at the two chairs of the IAASB and the ISB, are we not over-engineering this area. I mean, as, as you rightly said, Hans, uh, experts could have seen that the bank did not have capital. But still, I have an auditor who signs out, signs of a report as if nothing happens. And then the question the public is asking, but you know, who should have done what? I think the accounting standards 
should be clarified that if a situation is like that, that a bank has no capital, that it's not possible for management to prepare the financial statements and say we are in going concern. They should have a responsibility to do that, and that should be quite clear in the standards. Yeah. And the auditor should respond to that, to that management uh, declaration. But you know, it's, the public interest is not served, I think, by saying, you know, the auditors say, well, it's an accounting issue. The accountants say, well, it's an audit issue. I mean, the fact is that we had banks going bust. And then afterwards, and what was the same? People said it was all there, but nobody was doing anything about it. And that raises this public awareness and, and, and the trust and the, you know, the, the excitement among the, the public. Yeah, yeah I, still, I still think in this case, the prudential regulators were the primary responsible. They, they had created a system that was open to abuse and which was being abused tremendously. Um, and um, uh, uh, you didn't need to be an expert to see that there was hardly any capital in the system. You didn't need to be a prudential regulator, so it's true, yeah, that there could have been heroic auditors to counter this. But, um, I think the reality in this world is that auditors are not going to say this is a completely unsafe situation when the regulatory community says it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, listen, but they could have done so, and I don't think that changing a disclosure or something would make any difference. It was, all the information was there, clear. Donna Bovelineas, uh, legally entered in Spain this time. I have a question that turns things on its head a little bit. Um, both Eddie and Stavros alluded to the fact that good quality processes are necessary in other spheres besides standard setting. And uh, some of my recent work sitting on boards and audit committees, I am appalled at the lack of financial literacy amongst audit committee members. It's fine to have them independent of management, but there's always a trade-off between independence and uh, understanding of the situation. In some cases, the need for rather expert understanding. Because when an audit committee is communicated with by the auditor, there's an expectation that the lights are on on the governance side of the house. Uh, there is also a sense of the governance people having enough wherewithal to be able to say, have the auditors done a good job? I don't know where the line is because my own uh, personal study and other experiences have made me reasonably expert in all of the types of standards that are on the table at that moment in time. But I'm concerned because those people like myself are often not uh, available very much because they're being stretched so thin across audit committees. And the degree of dependence that is placed on people like myself by other members of the audit committee, never mind the board at large, is a burden. And one worries, as hard as one tries to do the job, that one day one will miss something and something went wrong in terms of auditor performance, company performance, or whatever. And we brought the house down individually because everybody else was looking to us to basically make the decisions. Who is responsible to raise the bar enough? It's not you guys, because you can only um, deal with what auditors need to do. But can you, as experienced and wise people in this arena, speak to your counterparts in business, government, other regulatory groups, whatever, and get this message out to them that those in charge of governance really be, need to be fit to be in charge. 
Uh, maybe I can respond to that, um, but, uh, since this is not squarely in the standard setting board uh, space. Uh, my experience has been different. I'll just say that, that uh, audit committee uh, members have been very strong on the audit committees that I chair, but um, I will say that I'm, uh, um, uh, it's something that I, I spend a lot of time and effort on, but, but I'd say those charged with governance in particular are, uh, need to be more self-policing, uh, the, the quality of the people on the board and, and uh, on the audit committees is the responsibility of each of us who serve on boards and, and auditors uh, um, uh, can be only in, we are very much a, at IFAG very much proponents in that all areas of the financial reporting chain need to be strong in order to support each other. I often use the analogy, you know, we just can't expect to, to play football and only have goalies that are trying to catch all the, the kicks. We have to have strong players on the field too. And so I'm very much in your camp and I know that around different, uh, uh, around the globe there are different standards, listing standards, other standards uh, and expectations of, of audit committees and of those charged with governance that you can technically comply with the independence rules, but you have to have relevant experience and competence too. And so I think it takes all of us together. I think uh, the speaking out on behalf, uh, you know, for, for those who want to see all of it strong is very important, but I think all of us have that responsibility to speak out on that. And Jane has something to say right now, so. Um, can we get a mic to Jane? Um, I'd just like to um, just build on this heroic auditor concept because um, I actually think that many stakeholders are actually looking to, to the auditors to be a touch heroic. And in some of the standards that we're setting at the moment, we're actually asking auditors to step outside slightly what has been their traditional role in the sense of key audit matters, and we've seen how we're now asking auditors to actually take, a, if you like, a, a stronger step in identifying those. Um, in NOCLA, we're going to be asking, frankly, auditors to make some fine judgments about what they can or should disclose. So, and, and I guess I'm, um, trying to suggest that it is partly in the standard setting space that we can um, lead or suggest to the audit profession through guidance or through the standards themselves that the expectations of the external stakeholder community is not that a bank can be going bust but the standard says you don't have to disclose or you don't have to put it in highlights so everybody just sits there quietly and says, well, if the regulators say it's okay, well, you might be surprised, depositor or investor, later on when the whole thing comes unstuck, but um, that's sad because, frankly, the standard was perfectly clear on the surface and, and they declared what they needed to declare. I think that we're we should be moving into a, into a different phase where we're actually are stretching the audit profession about what they contribute to the capital markets and to the investing community in particular. And certainly, I think there are challenges in no cloud, there are challenges in audit quality that will ask the profession for more. And I think that's a good thing. And I worry that, that somehow a reliance on anodyne reporting which does not list the risks that really are those that are expected to be, be seen by the investors and other stakeholders, we're not doing our job in the standard setting process. Uh, but but my, my point is that the risks were all there to be seen with current reporting requirements. It was obvious, it was glaring, but everybody was looking the other way. It's, it is one of the most amazing um, occurrences of mass cognitive dissonance in, in the history of the financial uh, industry. It is unbelievable what happened. Uh, so, but, so I, you know, I'm not here to defend the auditors, but, but the, 
this was ultimately a crisis of solvency of the whole financial system. Uh, inclu uh, and and, and uh, almost all the banks were extremely leveraged. And I can, I don't think you can, exp and, and, and the, it's the primary task of the regulators to de defend that system and to make it safe. Now, we all know that things went wrong. There's a lot of repair being done. Uh, the uh, regulatory requirements are being uh, strengthened quite a bit. By the way, also at the end of this story, the banks will still have only 3 4% real capital, so it's not st still not really fantastically safe. Uh, but it will be at least more than, than what it used to be. Uh, I don't think that in such circumstances uh, you can expect the auditor to say, well, uh, you, you know, despite the fact that the central bank of my country says uh, the, the bank in question has 14% regulatory ca capital, I don't believe it's I enough, so I raise the red flag. That's not how the, work, the world works. Um, we have a lot of hands up, and, I, and I'm not sure if this is an, uh, if we are now talking about standard setting or if we are talking about uh, the role of the different players in, in the enterprise. Jane, uh, to respond to you, uh, I agree we always need to be enhancing audit quality. We always need to be stretching uh, what it is that we can do uh, through the accounting profession. I don't think there's any disagreement on that. I do think you hear a variety uh, of, of issues about in my analogy about the goalie, is that all parts need, need to be strong, too. It cannot be left to one player in the financial reporting um, arena to do everything. And, and so the, the accounting profession, I think you would find the standard setting board chairs would say, we all want to do the, the best that we can do, and, and <clears throat> we have an expectation of the profession to, to increase audit quality in any way in, in, in possible. But we must also be advocates for and encouragers of others also participating to their uh, best level uh, also. I'm, I, I saw, like, 15 hands up, so I know this is a top topic. Um, but, but Eddie is, in fact, in charge of the microphone right now. <laughs> I can't surrender the microphone to another willing speaker. Okay. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, I don't think your mic's on, Chris. All right. Uh, International Accounting Education Standards Board, Chris Austin. All of the speakers were very clear about the importance of transparency and interaction with stakeholders and that standard setting is a dynamic and iterative process, um, which provokes two observations and a question. The two observations are that it's really important to have strong continuing professional development for individual accountants and auditors to stay ahead of, uh, or at least try and keep pace with changes in the uh, profession. Um, the other observation, um, which I'd be interested on in the panel's reaction, is that standards are only ever going to codify good practice or best practice looking back. It's, it's going to be hard to set standards that deal with an uncertain future. Um, so my question, picking up on the debate we've just had, is how do you think we should assess the value and impact of standards or of the standard setting process, and they may be two different things. Thank you. Does anyone want to take that one? Well, I, I made my own private calculation about the value of IFRS and the, in the millions, in the billions. But <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to, uh, to quantify or uh, the, 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 the value of, of, of standards. In the case of, uh, of IFRS, what we try to do in this document is exactly how, through which mechanisms do our standards provide value for society at large. Uh, I think that the public at large is a stakeholder in our, in, in our standards. Um, and, and, and I came up with this, that, that the holy trinity that, that I mentioned is through transparency, accountability, and, and, uh, and efficiency. 
Um, and I suspect that many, uh, many of the, um, uh, your standards, uh, uh, Arnold, uh, provide value through that same chain. Yeah, and I fully agree to that. And I think we have to ask about whether indeed it's adding value. Um, and if I just stay with the audit reporting example, and I fully agree with Jane's observations, in the end, you have to ask investors and other users, does this help you? Do you like it? And the surveys, for example, that have been done already about twice by the Financial Reporting Council in the UK are a clear example of that. Um, I mentioned the investor awards in the UK, and we soon will see that happening in more parts of the world, of course. It's now really early days, but then we have to reach out and to the end users, not to the, the first in line that have to apply it primarily, but, but for those who it was intended to, to assist. And I've brought one example of well, kind of heroism with me because it's indeed changing. Uh, very recently, a week ago in South Africa, a company called Attack Limited, which is in real estate, gross revenue 1.3 billion. And the auditors wrote there regarding the valuation impairment of goodwill and intangibles. Overall, we found the models and assumptions applied in the assessment, etc., appropriate and concur with the director's decision to evaluate and to impair a certain investment. On the other hand, the assumptions and inputs used in the impairment model for the Wi-Fi rights were found to be fairly optimistic found to be fairly optimistic. We're already getting used a bit to that kind of language. We have seen other examples. But just think back three years ago, would you expect any auditor to say, well, I found this valuation fairly optimistic in a public document? So that's, that's what is changing. And that's the question you can ask people, does this help you? And if, if in the ones if in the, in, in the advent of the next financial crisis, if the auditors do not even raise key audit matters for, for the banks, then they will have certainly failed. Yeah. Can, I, uh, um, can I make a remark uh, I'll stop. To, to Chris's point? Um, it, one of the problems of assessing the impact of standards is that sometimes the impact is uh, of a particular body of standards in, is interrelated with the impact of another body of standards. Uh, for example, when we talk about audit quality, for example, uh, obviously ethics has a contribution to that, but not only ethics. So if audit quality is observed somehow to have an effect, you really then have a problem of apportioning the benefit, and each standard setting board is going to fight for primacy in that case. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, being myself, uh, after many years of having been an empirical economist, I, I, I look at the sort of empirical evidence we might look at, <clears throat> besides the crisis, uh, but in normal times. <clears throat> and I think that something you mentioned, Hans, cost of capital issues are very important, because if the standards together are working, you do see uh, a salutary effect in terms of trust, and, and therefore in terms of the ability to raise capital and cost of capital. So that's one way to, to look at it. Uh, the other is that there is a body of findings that's accumulating now uh, as inspection findings, and I think we really have to uh, make sure that we make use of that as empirical evidence for the quality of uh, behavior. Uh, so in these two terms, I would, in these two areas, I would say that you can try to find some sort of hard basis. Okay, get a microphone here in the middle, right there, right now, right where you are. I'm trying. <laughs> Good morning. It's Chuck Horstman from the PIOB. Hans, the question to you, uh, both the other chairmen mentioned the work with their national standard setting bodies and how helpful they are. And, and I guess getting back to the going concern issue, I know that in the U.S., the uh, FASB, has taken on and worked with the PCAOB on kind of on both bookends of dealing with the going concern. So just interested in your views on whether the FASB got it right with their disclosure standards or whether they went too far or have you considered what they've done? Um, to tell you the truth, I don't know off, off the top of my head. Uh, I'm, I'm sure my staff must have looked at it and we might even have discussed it, but it's not, doesn't belong to my 
present knowledge at this point. Sorry. <laughs> but we do generally work very closely with national standard setters. Yes. Uh, I'm going to check with Rocio, too. Uh, time. Um, yeah, it's time. Do we need to end? Okay. No, we're done. <laughs> She's giving me one of those. But, but if we could just take this one more question, um, then uh, we will close. Thank you, and um, it's Marek Grabowski. I'm, I'm uh, at the FRC, but also on the IASB. Um, I just wanted you to pick the question of interactions up a little bit further, um, and, and some of the things that you all said. Um, Hans, you talked about the, the three um, goods. Uh, I agree, I think those are three important goods. Um, Arnold, you talked about holistic, doing things in a holistic way very early on on your slides. Um, and Stavros, you talked about the competition for um, getting the credit uh, among standard setters. So if you take those things together, it, it makes me think, what is the system that we are part of? Um, various people have uh, talked about elements of it, um, you know, the individual standard areas, uh, but also um, uh, you know, accounting versus um, auditing. Um, and I think there are two other bits if we want to look at the total system. One is governance, uh, and that's been mentioned by a lady over there. Um, and uh, the other is stewardship. Right? What is going on <clears throat> in the investment community uh, to deliver the outcomes? Because really, hands your outcomes are the com combined effect of all those things working together in that dynamic uh, system. And I think what some people have been commenting on in terms of the, um, the, the expectation of the public, I would say that they would expect the system as a whole to deliver the right outcomes. Uh, and if they don't, if the system as a whole doesn't deliver the right outcomes, um, then each element of it will be blamed. I don't think blame, it's possible to say in that process that, you know, one party is to blame. So my question for you, sorry about the long introduction, but my question for you is, where in that system are there not good enough interactions? Where, those interactions to me are needed to ensure that the things we believe in standard setting terms, for example, um, should be the outcomes, that the other parts of the system are going to help us deliver those, that we're not going to be blamed at the end of the day because somebody else failed to do their part. So really your reflections, where in the system are, are, are they lacking? Three very sh short points to stimulate some thoughts for you. IFRS 9, implementation of um, systems to deliver that in the companies. Who's making sure that happens? That's one, one area. Second area, in corporate reporting, I'll link it very briefly to gain concern, but you've had a lot of beating up over gain concern already, so I'll keep my comments there limited. But if the answer isn't totally in the going concern reporting in the financial statements, maybe something more needs to be done <clears throat> in the risk reporting area in wider reporting. How are we making sure that the crossover between those two things is happening? Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I think this is, this is also relevant when we talk about things like integrated reporting. So, so uh, a long question, but I hope, hope we can get some answers. In the interest of time, let me, let me be very brief. Uh, my predecessor always said, we are there to keep capitalism honest, and we perhaps to make it honest. But uh, th that's what we are all about. We are an essential part of the whole governance uh, uh, structure. Where does it, why is it not always possible to get to the ideal in outcome that is because vested interests are extremely strong and never underestimate the power of vested interests. That is, and, and that goes ultimately through the political channel uh, and, uh, and it does not always lead to the, uh, the, to, 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 to the, uh, the outcome that we would like there to be. We were discussing similar questions last week in the IWSB in terms of who do we outreach have to, etc. The PIUB member there, Karl van Hulle, inspired us to think a bit out of the box and to go to other organizations than we typically do. And you mentioned employee organizations as an example. And then you said, well, in the end, you better ask your mother-in-law. Um, I thought of that a bit because she's in heaven. Um, but I came back the other day and said, well, mother-in-law would have said, as long as it's good for the children, go ahead. 
And that's the wider perspective. What does it do to society at large? And IFAC has this diagram of five circles, and often we are more in the inner circle. And then we talk about financial stability and financial reporting supply chain. But in the end, it's what is doing to developing countries in these days of all these refugees. How do we help stability in the world? And in the end, that's a larger perspective, and children are a symbol of that. So that would be my final perspective. Stavros, any final comment? Well, with that, uh, will you please join me in thanking our panelists for this discussion?